Today we have Duncan Richardson, whose subject is Civilising Brisbane. This is describing how a few ladies of the late 19th century influenced the people of Brisbane. So I'll call upon Duncan to take the floor. Thank you. So, um, probably about five or six years ago, I did a talk here on my earlier book, Year of Disaster, and it was through that process that I was led to the three women that I'm talking about today. The photo on the right there shows Queen Street in the morning after the enormous fire that destroyed most of the CBD in December 1864. This was a photo taken from the top of the convict barracks looking down towards um, Albert Street. A, a witness to the fire did this sketch in the days afterwards and the courier mentioned that in the archway up there there were lots of people sheltering who had lost their homes. The poor people who lived behind that part of Queen Street in humpies, uh, metal shacks, had barely seconds to escape. The fire moved so quickly through there. And a lot of them were sheltering in that archway. And I wondered what happened to those people after the fire. So I went looking for anybody who did social welfare kind of work in Brisbane, specifically who might have helped those people. So I was basically asking myself these questions. There was no government support, which is not surprising. Um, the only kind of support you could get in those days was a loan, and some people were still paying off loans that they'd taken from the floods in 1863. So there wasn't a lot of um, fat on the system as far as people were concerned. There were none of the charities that we now recognise. They didn't form till at least 15, 20 years after these events. I looked at the church records. I couldn't find any reference to the disaster at all in those. I did find a mention in the friendly societies, the um, nationality and language based groups. They were helping out individuals, but not in the large numbers as were needed by the um, disaster. But at least they were some things. So I assumed that mostly people de then depended on kind of informal help from friends or, or strangers on an ad hoc kind of basis. But I did come across the names of these three women, not in relation to the disaster, but in relation to generally giving social support. People at the time were pretty critical of the way Brisbane was, at least some of them were. Um, William Hill, who was involved with setting up the Botanical Gardens, wrote that it was, he had unformed streets, atrociously kept shops and houses few and far between, which was a bit of an exaggeration because he was talking about Brisbane at this stage and parts of it were quite crowded. But very lacking in any kind of services. The Daily Guardian, comparing it to much more established towns, found Brisbane sadly lacking. <laughs> and of course they were constantly being reminded of what Sydney and Melbourne were achieving when it came to services. Brisbane was part of what some people were calling at the time, or Queensland generally, the unwanted woman problem, which was related to the imbalance in the population. Now, in Britain, there was a growing number of educated middle class women who wanted to work but couldn't find jobs that were suitable to their class. Mm -hmm. So, women were writing about this in some of the magazines that were being published, 
and is estimated to be a million plus extra women in, in the United Kingdom. The reasons for that were infant mortality rates in boys were higher, um, armed forces recruitment took large numbers of young men overseas, and immigration was into the colonies fairly heavily biased in terms of, of males, especially in the early years. So the solution that appealed to the colonial government and also the British government was for those women to go overseas. And they were also solving the problem of immorality in the colonies, which was considered to be quite a, an enormous problem. Just the presence of these women would raise the standards of morality as soon as they left the ship, was the general impression. And in fact, there's quite an amusing series of um, articles and letters in the Brisbane Courier when the rumour got around that a ship was coming with 400 governesses on board. <laughs> and you can almost hear the um, inner anguish of these gentlemen who remember days of having a governess <laughs> and don't want to be put under that kind of regime again, <laughs> including the Premier. So, first of the women I came across was Eliza O'Connell. She was um, the first to arrive as well in, in Australia. Her diaries tell quite a lot of detail about her life in Brisbane. Before she came here, she lived in Sydney and in New South Wales in the bush and Port Curtis. There's not a lot of information about that part of her life, but once she arrived in Brisbane, she started referring to her um, meetings and growing friendship with Lady Bowen, the wife of the first governor. Now, fortunately, her letters home were destroyed in a fire following an earthquake. Um, but quite a few people mentioned her in their accounts, and there are some of her more formal speeches still preserved. And the third in this trio is Ellen Whitty, or Mother Vincent as she became known. She wrote very warm and um, evocative letters to her con convent and also to her brother who was in Ireland at times or sometimes in Italy. And um, I was surprised by the relaxed informality of those letters. I'd had this image of a mother superior being very stiff and formal, but nothing could be further from the truth. You really get a sense of her as an individual from her letters. And of course, they were assisted by many other women, but not, not many of those have left the records to the extent that these three have. So, arriving in December 1859, so they were the first to arrive in Brisbane. Eliza O'Connell was in Port Curtis at this stage. Huge excitement, especially about um, Lady Bowen coming, because she was Greek and she was a countess, and that was seen as exotic. And um, she was very impressed by the welcoming committee as they sailed up the Brisbane River. The Courier was publishing articles and letters for at least a week beforehand because they didn't know exactly when they were going to be arriving. It's hard to imagine these days with communications that we have that they were reliant on um, rumour and signals and just the general expectation of when a ship leaves Sydney it takes so long to get here. But it was never that certain. So it had built up to quite a frenzy. During her time in Brisbane, her family grew from one child to um, four, and she was very keen on being a hands-on mother, and she criticised other women of her, her class who relied on nannies. One of her roles was um, attending the uh, Sunday school picnics held in the botanical gardens, and. Um, Rosa Prade, who later became a famous novelist, remembered those picnics. 4,000 people packed into the gardens and Lady Bowen walking through 
like this sort of um, princess who stepped out of a fairy tale. And all the kids would be gathering around her, hoping that she'd recognise them. And um, sometimes she did, but no doubt she must have got quite exhausted by the social demands placed on her. After some time in the house that's now the deanery, which has survived, they moved into the purpose-built government house. And her official functions, including lots of openings, this here she's um, opening a rifle range when she was um, the first lady in Victoria. But that's the kind of work that she was expected to do here as well. She had quite a large staff to manage. This was taken the year after they left, but so many of these people would have been the same that um, were there during the Bowens period. She didn't like the summers in Brisbane, so she would often escape to Sandgate. And more recently, um, I've found that the house they stayed in, which had belonged to Henry Jordan, the immigration agent, um, was on <coughs> Rainbow Street at Sandgate, just behind Eagle Terrace. So they would go there for weeks, sometimes just her and the children, sometimes Eliza would go as well. I've had a quick look on um, Street View to see if the house is there, but I'm pretty sure that it isn't. Um, when they arrived, shortly after, her husband wrote back to a colleague that distress and pauperism are unknown in the colony. And I think <laughs> she and he would have known from the very first day as they rode through the streets in the carriage that there were plenty of homeless people kids roaming the streets with, um, often they were orphans and they had nowhere to go. So she knew that was tr not true and he probably knew it was not true, but he had political publicity reasons for claiming that everything was under control. So there were four main areas of work that these three women became involved in. The alleviation of poverty was a big one. And some of that came from what people called false immigration, where people were encouraged to come to the colony, and yet they, their work and their qualifications meant that they were not going to get any sort of decent work. Um, and some of that false immigration was due to Henry Jordan, the immigration agent, who went around Britain telling people that there were lots of jobs, there was plenty of money in the colony, and in fact, the voyage out was so health-giving that you'll never feel the same again. <laughs> and that was true because the mortality rate on those ships was quite high, especially for children. So there was a lot of what people called then puffery going on in the advertising of Queensland. The hospital in 1864, when the disaster happened, was falling down. The the hospital committee reported that the ceiling was falling in. All the patients of whatever type were squashed into the same small premises. So they, one of their tasks was to do something about that. Education, particularly secondary education for girls, was almost non-existent. There were a few private colleges in houses that existed at that time, but there was no systematic um, teaching done by qualified teachers and Ellen Whitty was a qualified teacher so that was one of her main goals to provide good education for girls and the arts were an interest as well although not as much of, of a priority as the other things uh, especially music there were some gentlemen in Brisbane who had a big thing about being inferior to Ipswich and there was a lot of sibling rivalry going on literally because a lot of the businessmen who settled in Brisbane seemed to have brothers who'd settled in Ipswich and established um, businesses. And um, the gents in Ipswich joked that if you wanted to hear opera in Brisbane, you had to go to Frog's Hollow after a nice downpour of rain. <laughs> and that was the only way you were going to hear decent singing in Brisbane. So the, a lot of them had this thing like, we, we be, we're even behind Ipswich. We're competing with them to become the capital, um, although Bowen never had any intention of changing it from Brisbane. 
but um, the gents in Ipswich like to rub that in um, every so often. I don't think these women were worried about that, but they were concerned with providing a good cultural education for young people. So this was a hospital at this time, a relic of the convict era. Its basic problems, as I mentioned. So one of their first jobs was to provide a, a lying-in hospital and to get the maternity patients out of that horrendous situation. And it's shown, first they moved to a house on Leichhardt Street, but then this purpose-built building on the left there where the arrow is pointing, that, was, that became the lying-in hospital. And then later, that one of their legacies is the, what became the Lady Bowen Hospital up on um, Wickham Terrace. Um, but that was their starting point. The servants' hall uh, as well, the servants' home, they knew there were lots of young women arriving in Brisbane looking for jobs who were being exploited as soon as, actually before they left the shift. One of the, somebody commented that there are lots of young women arriving, imagining they are engaged to be married, but as soon as the ship docks, the, um, the male takes off and is never seen again. So there's a lot of concern that these young women who are often traveling alone are being exploited. So they offered accommodation and training at the servants' home. But they also thought they needed a bit of moral improvement, <laughs> which um, in the early years, a lot of the, the women put up with, but by uh, 1875, it was becoming less popular. But it did serve an immediate need. Now, Lady Bowen found herself in a, a, an interesting triangle. She was quite an accomplished person through her family background in the diplomatic service. Um, her island of um, Santikos, as it's called now, was a key place during the Napoleonic Wars, and Britain took it then. And then by the time um, Bowen was there in the 40s, it was a staging post for the Crimean Crisis, which then became the Crimean War. So through her family, she was experienced in meeting diplomats, and that's how she met um, George, I presume. Um, she, because she was a countess, she was senior to him in status, and some of his enemies in Brisbane liked to comment on that, because that sort of put him in his place. He was a bit pompous. Um, and she was also very accomplished as a singer and a musician. When they arrived, George decided to speak on his own behalf and on hers, as was the custom. The third part of the triangle was the first premier. He wrote home to his um, mother and sister about Sir George's eccentricities, and he blamed Lady Bowen's headaches on her husband, and that's why she took off to Sandgate, which may well have been true. He was so full of praise for her beauty that I, at first I assumed that, that he was having an affair with her, but more than likely, from what I've read since, his partner John Bramston, his housemate John Bramston, was his real partner. And it was more like a, a, a sibling relationship. She often took the children to visit him. He was like an uncle to them. and. Um, so there was nothing of that nature going on between them. But so he is constantly talking about her. He loved to tell stories about how she would rebuke him. One day he was complaining about having to go to many functions. And she told him that he not only should go, and if he didn't enjoy it, he still had to pretend that he did. So that was his duty. And she was very keen on duty. And not just other people. She was. You know, pretty straight down the line with her own as well. One year she escaped further than Sandgate and went back to Europe to visit her family. And she did suffer periodic migraines. In Eliza's diaries, she often mentions that um, Lady Bowen was out of action 
and Eliza would often go over there then and look after the kids for her. And one of her refuges was the garden and the, if you look behind Old Government House there's a statue of her in that garden in what's now QUT. And at the other end of the social scale, um, the Premier Herbert mentions Elizabeth Whitkin, Whiskin, who became, came to Brisbane from his hometown, so he found her a job at, Parliament, at Government House. And she was making £12 a year, which he said would be liberal wages. But if you look at the expense that um, some basic items at the time, you can see that it was far from liberal. And Miss Whiskin was living in a tent at that time, like a lot of people, because there just wasn't enough accommodation. Musgrave Park and Spring Hill were full of tents. And in, around that time, Herbert gave his himself and his colleagues an increase of £700 per year. <laughs> this is a view looking from where All Hallows is now, when Ellen Whitty and their uh, five other sisters came to Brisbane. Within a few days they'd found, um, or within a few weeks, they found accommodation in that area in the house of a retiring doctor Now, you get the impression that they were mostly qu quite young. They definitely had a spirit of adventure. Um, to take that trip, you would have to have been, because they had some idea of what they were letting themselves in for. And she wrote home about her surprise that she was having to deal with Protestants. Now, when she says <coughs> simple there, we need to think of that in positive terms. Yes, yes. She's not having a go at them. She often uses simple as a, a word of praise for people. Um, but she, although she found them good and simple, she just wanted to nudge them in the right direction. <laughs> so, and she thought that music was a, a way to do that. One of the nuns was a really beautiful singer. And people would turn up to St Stephen's Church just to hear her sing. So she thought that was excellent, get them in that way. One idea that she had which was not so likely to succeed was the model of a young Catholic woman who was a domestic servant who had a chronic disease that then became serious and she died from. But Ellen thought that the model of her stoicism and her faith throughout that would convert the, her employers. But as far as I know, that didn't actually happen, and I think she probably misunderstood the British class system if she thought that a, a servant was likely to convert the employers. Mm -hmm. And it's also a rather expensive way of converting the Protestants. <laughs> so this was a house they moved into, called Adderton, as it still is now, that um, was where that uh, Dr Fullerton had lived. He was moving out, so they moved in and that became the focus for the development of their school, now All Hallows. They also set up a technical training school. There was a lot of boys who were leaving school at um, age 10, and they had nothing that would get them a job. So they decided to offer technical trades work, training for them. There was also all these kids on the street that they wanted to find a place for single women who had kids, teacher training, especially a lot of young women coming from the country who wanted to get some training that would help them to get a better job. And it wasn't just Brisbane, they were doing these um, projects, it was Ipswich, Rockhampton, Maryborough. Most of the major centres had, over the years, had a group of the, the Mercy nuns who went there. Now I've I never expected to be doing a project relating to the Mercy Nuns because my experience was from hearing people who'd been taught by them in the 70s who had horror stories about bitter and twisted women behaving in a very cruel manner. But these were exactly the opposite. The girls who were taught by these women had nothing but praise for them. They were 
they'd come here with ideals and they, they followed those through. They went out and did the sort of work that most people would not want to do. And that was their whole purpose. Here's a, a typical class and one of the surprising things for me was to read that more than half at some stage of these girls were from Protestant families. They, they recognised that the education Ellen Whitty and the others were giving them was the best and it was certainly better than sending them the kids to the UK and taking the risk of the, um, the voyage and the, the years apart. So a lot of the Protestant establishments sent their girls to this school, including Eliza. Eliza had adopted a, a girl and she sent that girl to um, All Hallows and often refers to the wonderful mother Vincent. Vincent. Now that girl was a bit of a problem so Eliza had quite a few teacher meetings and principal meetings but she always refers very positively to, to Mother Vincent. A less positive aspect of Ellen Whitty's life was her relationship with Bishop Quinn. She wrote home in one letter, he's not, not always over sweet in words, though really kind in deeds. And unfortunately that was not true either. One occasion he heard that Ellen and the nuns had raised 30 pounds to send back to the convent in Dublin. And he persuaded Ellen to give that money to him, which he then gave to his brother, saying, oh, I've um, forgotten the brother, uh, Matt, that Matt will take it to Dublin. Ellen became concerned that that money had not reached its intended destination, so she had to write to the convent to find out if it had. And money was a real weakness for Quinn. He liked to spend money that he didn't always have and then expect the nuns to earn it back. In spite of that, he was critical of her leadership style. She was very much a kind of consensus um, sort of leader, whereas he wanted her to be an autocrat like he was. And in one letter she said, I could tell many grievances, but the telling would not benefit. Some of her nuns thought that she should tell those grievances and that their criticism of her was that she wasn't, she didn't stand up to Quinn as much as they thought she, she should. <coughs> Quinn was regularly buying real estate mm. and interfering in the convent's business. He told Ellen that until she had a certain number of nuns, then her convent was under his jurisdiction, which was a complete fabrication. Mm. There was no rule in the system she should have been in charge from the very beginning but she didn't know that and effectively she was in charge nobody went to him if they wanted anything done they went to her now it came to a head with this conser quite conservative catholic priest um, father McNabb, who wanted to get at quinn but he didn't want to do it directly so he did it by attacking Ellen Whitty. And his cause was the concerts that they used to put on at All Hallows, sometimes going until 11 o'clock at night. And the audience was mixed, as in not just Catholics. And his argument was these young Catholic girls were exposed to the immorality of Protestants late at night. <laughs> and who knows what would happen in those circumstances. So in a crowded hall, full of parents, he imagined some sort of immorality was about to take place. So he wrote to the authorities in Sydney. Quinn got the feedback from that and used that to replace Alan Whitty with a more compliant nun, Sister Bridget Conlon. Now, Lady, as she became Lady Eliza O'Connell, she had a husband who was High maintenance, but not in the sense of um, Bishop Quinn. He also had a bit of a money problem. He liked to spend more than he had. He was an officer in one of the volunteer regiments, and that meant he had to equip his men, and he had to pay for the equipment. He also liked the horses, 
um, and like to bet on them and um, maintain a racehorse. So that's where their money went. And as a result of that, they had to sell their large property up at um, Bowen Hills and move into rented accommodation on William Street. That's um, Portland Place, which was still there in the 1960s. Uh, but Eliza was not at all happy about that. But in the end, it may have worked out for the best because being just around the corner from Government House, it meant that her friendship with Lady Bowen became much more, um, much closer, I think, and much more easy to, to experience. This is the back part of her diary, just showing some of her correspondence. She was a huge letter writer. She recorded every letter she got and every letter she wrote. Like many uh, literate people in those days, but luckily, the, in this case, the um, evidence is still there. In her diary, she, towards the end of the year, she says she hopes she's been a support for her husband, in spite of being a bit of a lump but she was far from being a, a bit of a lump. She did committee work where she often work, was working with Lady Bowen. She ran meetings. She taught needlework at the St John's School, which was on that block where the um, Central Library is now. She supported her husband. Uh, over the years in Australia, they adopted two girls, including the one I mentioned before. When she knew uh, women were local women were having trouble, she would make clothes for their children um, and often take food. Especially when uh, another woman was sick, she would be like a, um, a sort of visiting nurse almost, trying to do what she could to help. So it wasn't just in the broader sort of changing society terms that she worked. She was very much tried to help whenever she could. She wasn't a fan of Bishop Quinn either, and that resulted from the incident of the toast. There was a lunch that she and um, her husband were invited to at St Stephen's, and at the end, Bishop Quinn proposed a toast to the Pope. And Morris and the other gentlemen were expected to take part in that toast. But as an Anglican, Morris found that not exactly an attractive pro prospect. And he didn't, but then he risked offending his host, but he stuck to his um, sectarian guns. But after that, Eliza was stopped in the street for a, a week or more by people who said, oh, I heard you were at that um, Catholic <laughs> lunch drinking a toast to the Pope. So it was, she was virtually being accused of having changed sides. And it was a serious issue. She was extremely angry with Quinn for deliberately setting up that situation. And he was known for that. There's a journalist, Spencer Brown, who wrote a memoir to, to trail his coat, which I think meant he liked to do things which would cause people to offend him, and then he could get angry about it. At one point in his, the newspaper that he bought, he wrote that anybody who criticised him was committing a sacrilege because his word was um, sacred. So you can imagine working for him was a bit problematic. So not that Eliza was a saint, she disapproved of mixed marriages and in particular Judge Lutwich who married his housekeeper who was a Catholic. So she was working class and a Catholic so that was double cross for um, Eliza. She said the marriage won't last six months, but when Lutwich died many years later, they were still together. So she was also quite wrong in her assessment. One of the examples where that shows, oops, now I need to go back. Okay. Now, how do I go back? Any technical experts? Ah, yeah, thanks. Okay, so this was a, a bazaar. At first, um, Bishop Quinn, the, the nuns wanted to run bazaars or fakes because they knew that was the best way to raise money in Brisbane. 
He wanted them to go door to door asking people in person. Um, they weren't happy with that. And eventually he relented and um, Sir Morris and Lady O'Connell were the patrons for this and people donated quite substantial prizes. The first prize being this um, wagon, this carriage value for 90 guineas. And there are lots of other prizes which are all listed there with quite an interesting selection. At the top of it, they made a point of saying they're raising money for All Hallows Convent for the Sisters of Mercy who devote their lives to the service of the poor, sick and ignorant of every denomination. So, although the ignorant part would not pass muster these days, <laughs> the point was they were not sectarian and many people saw them in that light. If Protestant girls at the school would, were not um, subject to religious indoctrination, unless their parents asked for them to be included in religion classes, they were not. That was their default policy. So some of the people in the press like to bring this issue up every so often, all oh, these nuns are converting everybody. It wasn't happening and they didn't want to do that. Excuse me, Duncan, yeah. what paper was that in? Um, it's a, it was a flyer yeah. and it's in the State Library. Oh. Uh, it was um, just, I think, it's only the flyer that has survived. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the Premier Herbert thought the nuns were conspiring against him and they were running election campaigns. I haven't found any evidence of that. There was a lot of hysteria about them. Um, but the people who actually knew them, like Eliza O'Connell, you know, she saw that they were doing decent work and they were you know, doing their best. They were making Brisbane a better place, as, as she was. So that comes really then to the question of how come these women are not as well known as they ought to be. James Brunton Stevens was talking about the convicts when he said that we have a tendency to forget things about our history. But it's true equally about women's contributions. It's about official stuff-ups and disasters like the Great Fire. That was neglected because the officials, the politicians, failed to do anything to prevent it and did very little afterwards as well. So they, don't, they didn't look good. Role of Aboriginal people in aiding settlement until recently was completely ignored. But I don't want to suggest that these three women and their colleagues transform Brisbane into a, a paradise, far from it. George Lansbury wrote in 1884, Brisbane has always been a hotbed of vice and crime. Oh my <laughs> the streets are foul day and night, and if I had a sister, I would rather shoot her dead than see her brought out here to this little hell upon earth. Luckily, he didn't have a sister. <laughs> And within a few years, he, he went back to the UK. But his point was not just um, an exaggeration. Lady Musgrave, by this time, was doing the same kind of work that Lady Bowen had done, meeting young women off the boat and trying to um, rescue them, basically. And there were plenty of other things going on. But a lot of it was due to the work that Lady Bowen and the others had done. And um, Ellen Whitty was still <coughs> in Brisbane, still running her projects here, as was Eliza O'Connell. So the legacies continue. One of them was nurse training. This is a group of graduates. The statue that I mentioned, she was distraught when they had to leave. He was really keen to get a promotion. He never thought Queensland was... Um, up to his standards. And on the other hand though, she I think had really made a home here. And I get the impression it was never quite the same for her in the other colonies they went to. And for Eliza, it was certainly never the same. None of the other governor's wives um, did she get as close to as with um, Lady Bowen. There's a direct line between the PA hospital and the work that these women did setting up 
separate hospitals in Brisbane. Even though the names have changed, there is a, a direct descent. The idea of having separate wards and separate places for different um, conditions was something that they started. Um, it, I'm not, not arguing that they invented it, but they certainly put it into practice here before anyone else did. And in 2006, a Lady Bowen Trust was set up to help the homeless. So people are still being inspired by her work and her model. Plenty of other commemorations, but a lot of people don't know, for example, like the, um, like the Roma, the town is named after her. She was Roma, um, the Diamantina Roma originally. So there are warships named after her, the Diamantina class frigates, like the one in the uh, Maritime Museum. <coughs> Diamantina River above there, Campus Street in Brisbane, and there was a steamer named the Lady Bowen. When Ellen Whitty died, this was her, the funeral notice in the boomerang. It was a massive funeral, um, but I think the main thing the three of them did was defuse the sectarian divide by, they didn't refuse to acknowledge it was there, but they, they crossed over it anyway. And all sections of the community, not just Catholics, she was grieved by many people. The only sort of public re um, relic of her is the Ellen Whitty Centre, just next to All Hallows. But I would like to bet very few people who aren't at that school know who she was and what she did. And she's buried at Nudgee Cemetery, so the procession from Brisbane out to the cemetery was enormous as well. So which town really was the Athens of the South? Eliza had a, a friend who claimed that Ipswich was the Athens of the South. Um, she found that amusing, <laughs> but um, the debate continued. So. They did eventually pr produce this concert hall on Adelaide Street. But in spite of all the work that um, Lady Bowen did in encouraging music, this history of Queensland music in 1961 admitted her completely. Oh. There was no mention of the concerts that she ran, the encouragement she gave to girls in person to, um, to, um, to practice and to perform. So the O'Connells are both buried in Tawang Cemetery up on the hill there near Governor Blackhall's tomb. Diamantina is buried in London, where was her husband's last posting. After leaving here, they went to New Zealand, then Victoria, where she was attacked by a woman in the street um, for no apparent reason that I can tell, but then she suffered a recurring injury in her shoulder after being knocked to the ground there. Um, then they went to Mauritius and um, finally back to the UK. Okay, so the, the, the book is available here today and also I have a few copies of the older ones. Captives of the Spanish Lady is about the um, Spanish flu outbreak in 1919 and the hundreds of Queenslanders who were interned in um, Tenterfield as part of the emergency quarantine, which it, when I was writing that pre-COVID seemed like a very distant thing, but has since become reality. And Jason Chen and the Time Banana is a children's book based around the Great Fire of 1864. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Um, wasn't uh, the suburb of Ithaca or the town of Ithaca named after this 